Welcome to the CortiCare webinar series, which presents topics related to EEG and neurodiagnostics, patient care management, research, and future applications. Today's event will last approximately 45 to 60 minutes. And in about an hour, you'll receive an email with a link to an evaluation form for this webinar. We welcome your feedback. And if you wish to receive a certificate of completion for one asset continuing education credit, submit the completed online form. And within a few days, a certificate will be sent to you. On this webinar platform, you may enter in your questions in the chat area. Uh, and with time permitting, we'll raise those questions and uh, Dr. Millichap will address them. Um, and please hold your questions to the end so it's clear uh, where they are. The role of EEG monitoring in critically ill children and neonates continues to evolve and expand with the recognition of the impact that unrecognized and untreated seizures have on the neurological outcomes of these patients. The indications for monitoring and the standards for its use and interpretation of the EEG have been established for more than 10 years and have been reviewed more recently with updated recommendations. Today's webinar presents the current standards covering the indications for and use of EEG monitoring in critically ill neonates and children. <coughs> Presenting today is Dr. John Millichap, uh, who is currently at Lurie Children's Medical Center in Chicago. Dr. Millichap is a pediatric epileptologist and an adjunct associate professor of neurology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Millichap has over 60 peer-reviewed uh, medical publications and serves as the editor of Pediatric Neurology Briefs. He is involved in the education of trainees and clinical translational research concerning EEG, epileptic encephalopathies, and epilepsy genetics. Welcome. Dr. Millichap. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you can turn on your video. So much for practicing beforehand. Huh? <laughs> there you go. Now go ahead and share oh. your screen and you're good. All right. Thanks. All right, everybody. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I've given a, a thousand webinars in the last uh, year and a half and uh, there's always a, always a wrench. But anyway, uh, again, I'm John Millichap, and I'm a pediatric epileptologist, uh, and I'm going to speak about uh, pediatric and neonatal ICU uh, monitoring. Uh, this is a very large topic, um, and uh, we have a short time together, uh, so I'm going to really do a fairly broad overview of uh, the uh, current practice uh, in pediatrics. So obviously, there's a lot a lot of more literature in the uh, adult uh, ICU monitoring, um, but go into uh, a little deeper dive in the guidelines for neonates and uh, children, which is uh, included with the uh, guidelines for adults, and then talk a little bit about outcomes in kids. So uh, the a uh, task force of the American or the uh, American Clinical Neurophysiology Society uh, uses uh, this term critical care continuous EEG, so uh, the acronym CCEEG. I think you'll see in uh, research articles and in charts people saying, you know, CEEG with a small c or VEG with a small or big. Uh, v and this uh, all sort of means the same thing, but just being a little bit more specific that this is monitoring that is in actually the the um, ICU setting. Uh, so you have some slightly different um, issues that these patients might be uh, going through, and and uh, you know have some different things to be thinking about. The uh, guidelines are really based on some observational trials and expert opinion rather than uh, any sort of a uh, 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 prospective trials or, or, or data that can uh, give us uh, very good evidence. So again, the, the guidelines for neonates were 2011, um, and uh, the, as was said, the guidelines for adults and kids was updated in 2015. The uh, practice in, in pediatrics uh, is increasing. Uh, with the development of the guidelines and just a greater recognition around, among uh, intensivists uh, and uh, pediatric neurologists that uh, this is important. However, uh, the hospitals and, and epilepsy centers uh, 
uh, that are caring for these children may lack the access to equipment, those computer equipment needs to be updated, uh, and do they have enough technicians or, or doctors to be uh, connecting the patients and looking at the studies 24-7, uh, uh, 365. So everybody does their best. Each center provides the highest level of care that uh, is allowed. Um, and the transfer of a patient for the uh, explicit uh, purpose of um, the CCEG has to balance the potential risks uh, and benefits to that patient. So in some cases, it may be uh, more beneficial to the patient to stay where they're at uh, and, and get treatment uh, otherwise using the resources that are, are provided. So the EEG guidelines for neonates, uh, again, was published in, in 2011, uh, Dr. Shellhouse and uh, others. I'm also going to talk uh, a bit about the uh, standardized EEG terminology. Uh, Dr. Dashida uh, was the lead author on that paper a couple of years later. So the, the indications uh, to evaluate for electrographic seizures. Uh, so this could be either uh, paroxysmal events, uh, jerking, uh, some concern for a seizure, or if the patient has a high risk for seizures. Uh, and second, to evaluate the severity of encephalopathy. Uh, is it a, a sudden onset encephalopathy change in mental status? Uh, and, and might be able to talk about the uh, age of the patient or some subtle, uh, subtle changes uh, that result in something called dysmaturity. So some of the, these examples of uh, clinical events that uh, might raise suspicion for neonatal seizures, uh, certainly uh, focal clonic or tonic movement, so jerking of one side of the body or one uh, part of the limb, uh, stiffening of one side of the body, uh, forced uh, eye, uh, eye deviation or head deviation, little jerks of the body, myoclonus, uh, stiffening again, tonic stiffening, uh, uh, sucking, um, swimming movements, bicycling is often reported. And then something uh, that we also are aware of that might be a seizure um, apnea, so stopping breathing, uh, having color change, turning blue or pale, or uh, the opposite, flushing and tearing, and changes in uh, heart rate uh, and blood pressure. So all these things might trigger the, the thought for uh, an EEG. And I'll just make one, one little um, uh, note here that if we get a call from the uh, neonatal intensive care unit that the baby has had a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, uh, we run, don't walk there because uh, we know that the, the person who's taking care of the patient isn't aware that uh, neonates don't have generalized seizures because uh, they don't have a complete myelination uh, that uh, connects the two hemispheres. So uh, we know that we uh, certainly need to go there and, and help take care of that baby. Uh, so examples of high-risk clinical scenarios, uh, which may lead to consideration of long-term neonatal EEG monitoring. Uh, there's uh, some, you know, sort of common sense um, uh, scenarios that confer high risk of neonatal seizures. Uh, certainly uh, HIE or uh, perinatal asphyxia from birth. Uh, if there's been a cardiac arrest uh, and, and cardiopulmonary res resuscitation, uh, if they're on ECMO or have some severe lung disease, not getting enough oxygen to the brain, uh, if there's signs of a CNS infection, uh, if there's been trauma to that neonate uh, and they have signs of uh, bleeding inside the brain, uh, other causes, genetic or inward errors of metabolism, uh, perinatal strokes, uh, uh, synovenous thrombosis. Uh, premature infants are also uh, at risk, uh, but I think that uh, across the, the country that there's a, probably not enough of these patients are, are monitored and, and uh, uh, just because of the um, there aren't very many of them, and there isn't a, a great, un, great um, understanding of uh, their particular neurological issues. The uh, EG1020 uh, system is modified uh, for neonates. Uh, you can see in circles here the, 
the electrodes that are commonly uh, used uh, for the uh, modified system for neonates, uh, the electrocardiogram, uh, respiratory belt, electrooculogram, which is a, a measurement of the uh, eye movements, and electromyography, so you have chin jerks and other um, uh, uh, myogenic um, uh, uh, polygraphy uh, can also help uh, identify the different uh, behavioral states of the baby. So uh, some sort of a visual ass assessment is needed, really. There's either synchronized video, which is uh, more and more common. I think uh, a decade ago, uh, you know, there was probably some some hospitals that would only have the opportunity to do um, EEG without video. Uh, but this can help us figure out if the patient's getting chest physical therapy, so the the um, respiratory therapist is, is patting uh, the patient, if the mother's patting the patient or the nurse is patting the patient because they're crying, uh, they're sucking on a pacifier, can cause artifact, if they have a ventilator or they're on uh, ECMO, uh, all these things we can just quickly open the video and, and check that out. If there's no video, then you certainly have to have somebody watching the baby and pressing the button uh, at the right time uh, if there's any events. Uh, for uh, any non-seizure events, it's also very important that the bedside observer press the button and describe what it is that they've seen. So press the button and also look at the camera and say, I pressed it because the finger was moving. Um, uh, then we know what we're looking for on the video. And sometimes these things can be very subtle and we don't even uh, realize what's happening. Uh, the uh, duration of the EEG is also specified in the guidelines. It should be at least an hour uh, minimum. Uh, high risk uh, patients that we just des described already, the high risk situations should be monitored for 24 hours. Uh, and if there's seizures found on, on those EEG, they should continue this for at least 24 hours seizure free. If the indication for the study is to capture a multiple, uh, uh, to capture a suspicious clinical event, uh, then ideally you want to capture multiple typical uh, suspicious clinical events to rule out a seizure completely. So the, the recommended practice is to uh, have the clinical neurophysiologist look at the first hour and give results to the clinical team, either verbally or by placing a note in the chart or both. Uh, and then every 12 hours uh, minimum or as needed for clinical concerns, if there's a spell or a push button or uh, some other change in the patient's condition, then the clinical neurophysiologist may be notified uh, to look sooner. Uh, technicians uh, should be monitoring the quality and sometimes a bedside nurse can also uh, look at the screen and notice that an electrode is falling off or uh, the screen is blank or something like that uh, if the technicians are not uh, glued to the, the monitor watching as they are uh, commonly now. Uh, and daily reports should be put into the medical record at least once a day. So for those daily reports, you want to, it's very important that the uh, PMA is included, and if you're not familiar with that term, I'll explain it here. The postmenstrual age is the gestational age measured from the time of the last menstrual period plus the chronological age. So sometimes you'll see in the chart something called corrected age or uh, estimated gestational age, uh, and so this is the the recommended term that uh, is uh, taken from the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations. Uh, for how to uh, discuss the age of a patient. So term is 37 to 44 weeks PMA, preterm less than 37 weeks uh, PMA, postterm 44 to 48 weeks PMA. You wanna uh, also note if there's any neuroactive medications, so certainly anti-seizure medications, but also any sedatives, uh, whether the patient's uh, under a hypothermia protocol uh, or really any, anything that might impact cerebral function. You want to document the duration of the recording, uh, say if it's uninterpretable because uh, it was disconnected or uh, the electrodes all fell off. Uh, the uh, characterization of the background features during the first hour, and then at least one hour of background with each of the 24 hours uh, thereafter. <clears throat> 
and uh, we want to say uh, if there's any epochs where the background changes. Uh, of course, seizure onset, uh, how often they're occurring, and, and when the last one occurred, and of course, whether there's status epilepticus. So fairly straightforward, uh, except maybe the PMA would throw some people off. So I th this is a great uh, figure that uh, was taken from a recently published um, atlas of pediatric neonatal ICU EEG. Uh, I used to use the, the um, uh, hand-drawn um, uh, version from uh, Ebersol and Pedley's book uh, that was um, uh, produced by uh, Dr. Clancy. Uh, this is sort of a, a modernized version of it, I think, um, and, uh, and uses a, you know, more digital um, uh, uh, pictures. Uh, so you can see that the, the little waves there are, are referring to sort of a graphical description of the EEG. And you can see as gestational age uh, is less than 30, then 30 plus, and 34 plus, and 37 plus, the EEG gradually becomes more continuous uh, in all stages of, of, of all behavioral states. So you have um, the awake state where the eyes are open and respirations are regular. You have active sleep where uh, the eyes are closed, but you have irregular respirations. So uh, sort of difficult to uh, tell the difference between those two states as uh, the kids get closer to term. And then quiet sleep uh, where you have uh, the eyes closed and regular respirations. So uh, the uh, this is where you'll see the most discontinuous patterns uh, in the younger children. Uh, the next um, uh, column there talks about the normal uh, uh, intervals and in seconds and the amplitude, so that's the, the voltage that you might see during those interburst intervals. Uh, and it can go up to half a minute. I've heard of even longer in uh, some uh, preterm children. Um, preterm babies um, as being normal, um, but at, at least uh, half a minute for uh, close to 30 weeks. Um, and then as you get a little bit older, maximum 20. And basically, if you, if you think you're looking at a term kid, uh, it should never be much bigger, uh, longer than four to six, and should always be over 25 uh, microvolts. Uh, synchrony uh, gradually uh, changes throughout these age groups. Uh, and reactivity, uh, the you know, very preterm uh, kids, uh, they're not going to re react necessarily to stimulus, uh, but it will be consistent once um, they are uh, closer to term. Here's some examples. Uh, this is a very preterm, uh, 24, 29 weeks. You can see the uh, discontinuous pattern. This is bursts and then a uh, interburst interval and then at uh, 30 to 33 weeks, uh, you can see that the bursts are a little bit longer and the interburst interval is a little bit shorter. There's a couple things noted here, the delta brushes, so some fast activity, riding uh, a, a broad uh, slow wave. And then also temporal theta bursts are very common uh, in this age group. So you look for these, what we call normal grapho elements to help you uh, know that you're looking at uh, a normal study for age. So if we see a delta brush in a 37-weeker uh, uh, PMA, uh, then we might say that that patient has a dismature uh, EEG. So that's how grapho elements uh, can be useful or, or uh, can be used in um, uh, interpreting the EEG. So trace discontinu, so some French words, um, refers to the uh, pattern that we, uh, we saw uh, where there's a uh, uh, burst and then interburst interval during, um, during the uh, sleep period. You can see the circle there uh, pointing to the regular respirations. And then trace alternant at 38 weeks, you can see the burst and the interburst interval, a little bit harder to pick them out because the voltages are, are closer as you get into the term realm. And then at 38 weeks, active sleep, uh, very 
uh, regular breathing, you can see at the bottom, uh, and in quiet sleep, regular uh, breaths there, but continuous. So talking about the uh, neonatal background, you have normal, uh, you have continuity, symmetry, synchrony, voltage of variability, reactivity, and dysmaturity as the major uh, components that you need to be thinking about. I'll just make a sp specific point about continuity. So you want to think about normal discontinuity, discontinuity. This is a trace discontinu and trace alternant in the appropriate uh, age group. If there's uh, excessive discontinuity, so uh, something that looks like um, trace uh, discontinu in a, a term child, for example, that would be abnormal discontinuity. Uh, and then there, there's specifics uh, that are beyond the scope of this talk uh, for all of these uh, various um, uh, aspects of the EG background, which I touched on, touched on briefly. So birth suppression uh, is an invariant, meaning uh, non-reactive. So the, the patient is stimulated. Uh, you wouldn't see a change, or there's, if there's clinical state changes, uh, you wouldn't see a change necessarily. Uh, there's a very low uh, voltage of the interburst interval, and there's no normal uh, grapho elements. So uh, the most severe uh, type of uh, background activity. So I'll just mention the uh, more recent, uh, 2020, ILAE classification of seizures and the epilepsy uh, modification for seizures in the neonates. Um, and I think that, that this uh, update so much has changed since 2011, uh, where there wasn't a big emphasis in those ACNS guidelines about differentiating uh, the uh, etiologies. Now we have more understanding of the genetic causes of, of epilepsy. Uh, HIE or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and in infections and strokes are still the biggest causes, but uh, genetic uh, is growing and uh, is becoming more important. So uh, this uh, paper gives a nice um, uh, graph about how and when to do uh, EEG or suggestion, uh, critically ill or with clinical suspicion, do a video EEG. Uh, or CCEG in the ACNS terminology. Um, and uh, you look for seizures. Uh, it talks about the difference between electrographic and electroclinical. Uh, there can be seizures, especially in, in babies with HIE, who have received phenobarbital, uh, where you have uh, electroclinical dissociation, meaning uh, that the patient has received the phenobarbital, stopped the jerking or whatever clinical they were signs they had, and uh, are now we just see the EEG seizure. And then electroclinical with uh, an EEG signature, but also a clinical sign. And the, the as I mentioned before, with some tongue in, in my cheek, about uh, babies don't have uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures. You can see here the motor uh, type seizures, automatisms, clonic seizures, um, epileptic spasms, myoclonic or tonic and non-motor, autonomic, so pallor, changing colors, or behavior arrests. Uh, one thing that's um, uh, commonly seen, uh, like in this uh, patient who uh, probably had HIE, uh, you can see this brief rhythmic discharge in the top panel uh, with a circle. So that's um, a similar uh, region, similar uh, uh, types of spikes, but uh, they don't progress or evolve uh, sufficiently to be referred to as a seizure. Uh, but there's not a lot of consensus or uh, evidence about what um, these BRDs are or, or uh, why they aren't considered seizures when the, the one on the bottom uh, is. So obviously the one on the bottom uh, fulfills uh, the, the basic criteria of uh, evolution and uh, frequency and amplitude and uh, duration. Uh, so it's quite clearly a seizure, but what if there's something sort of in between uh, the, the example in the top panel and the one at the bottom? And that's where we run into a lot of uh, issues where it's really the art of medicine uh, making a determination of this 
ictal interictal continuum. So what what um, uh, there's sort of a gray gray line between a seizure, electrographic seizure, and um, a uh, electrographic interictal finding like the brief rhythmic discharges or our bird BRD. So I'm I'm going to talk some a little bit um, uh, about some specific something specific that I've been working on for for many years, and this is uh, neonatal epilepsy uh, with a genetic cause. My colleagues uh, who uh, had a prospective study looking at uh, patients uh, with seizures at uh, various sites across the U.S. Uh, also uh, looked at uh, the patients who had genetic testing out of that larger cohort. <clears throat> and uh, surprisingly, or, or not surprisingly now, from what we know, uh, the majority of them uh, had seizures caused by KCNQ2, a uh, runner-up uh, SCN2A. So these are um, genes that um, code for uh, voltage-gated potassium or sodium channels, respectively, uh, in the brain and are uh, known causes of uh, neonatal onset uh, epilepsy. Now, this isn't a, a new thing. Uh, Dr. Odahara in Japan had studied EEG uh, in neonates uh, with suspected genetic cause. Obviously, in 1976, we didn't know uh, what the causes were. Uh, and he described the infantile epileptic encephalopathy with suppression burst, uh, which was later uh, given the eponym Odahara syndrome. Uh, this is a figure from his paper showing the his description of uh, burst suppression, uh, which is uh, slightly different from the, the other version in, given in the more re updated atlas. I uh, just show that there's uh, the same terms are used in the literature, but there's some variation in uh, the visual interpretation. Uh, here's another EEG from a child with KCNQ2 uh, showing uh, another variation uh, where there's some suppression there and there's uh, abundant multifocal spikes. So the KCNQ2 has, um, I think the majority of them will have something that is discontinuous <clears throat> but maybe doesn't meet the criteria uh, for birth suppression specifically. So that's one clue that you might be looking at KCNQ2. Uh, you can't hear the sound, uh, but here's a, a patient of mine who's, he's just crying right now, and his, his parent's going to come over and grab his hand to soothe him. It's when he quiets down now, and his eyes open, and you can see he has some nystagmus, uh, and now stiffening. And if it wasn't such a black and white video, you can see that he was having some color change as well. And now the seizure is over, he's crying again. So that stiffening period where he was uh, extending his arm and, and uh, posturing corresponds to the, uh, the middle of the top panel where there's a, uh, a diffuse uh, attenuation of voltage uh, with some uh, subtle overlying low voltage fast activity. You can see that uh, fast activity develop uh, over the left hemisphere uh, predominantly in the uh, upper upper portion and evolve uh, by slowing uh, in a recruiting rhythm and, and finish up um, uh, there in the bottom panel. Uh, so um, I've seen a lot of babies with KCNQ2. Uh, they have seizures that look like that and EEGs that look like this. Uh, so um, you have a pretty good chance if you see this that the patient probably has KCNQ2. And I think it's pretty easy to differentiate that seizure from, uh, say, the seizure we saw before, uh, this focal seizure in a patient with HIE, where there's probably no clinical uh, accompaniment and they're having these long runs of, of spikes. So uh, I think it's pretty easy to, to have a guess. And why is that important? Because we, we know about this KCNQ2 encephalopathy for almost a, a decade now. And we really want to treat the babies appropriately, or, or this is the beginning I, I, idea of precision medicine or personalized medicine. Uh, so the, the paper on the left there, uh, I wrote with um, and studied with uh, several of my colleagues, uh, specifically uh, Kristen Park, Tammy Deshita, and, and Ed Cooper. Um, and we looked at uh, patients who were treated 
uh, with a potassium channel opener. Um, uh, this was outside the neonatal period, but the younger they were treated, the better they seemed to do. That was a, a retrospective um, a pilot study. Uh, the paper on the right by uh, Pisano and, and Chilio um, talks about how sodium channel blockers, so the most common of common drugs, so uh, carbamazepine, uh, can be very effective at stopping the seizures in, in patients with KCQ2. Uh, so it is very important to recognize that that patient has KCQ2, and instead of uh, giving them more and more phenobarbital, which may or may not help, or levotiracetam or some other medication, give them a sodium channel blocker. And at the bottom is a, uh, uh, a study that's ongoing right now, uh, enrolling patients one month to six years old uh, who have KCNQ2 developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. Uh, and they're using a new formulation, pediatric formulation, of the potassium channel opener, uh, azogabi. So as we finish up neonatal, just three things to remember uh, that uh, neonatal EEG is hard. Um, some, I've heard some people say that uh, if you don't read neonatal EEG often, just don't. Um, and that's not to be mean. It's uh, just, it's a very um, uh, specific type of, of EEG and uh, that it's something you need to get used to. I think even experienced uh, EEGers, uh, pediatric EEGers are opening textbooks uh, sometimes to look uh, just to remember, what, what am I supposed to see uh, at this different age? But in basically look for continuity and these graph elements to give you a clue whether it's normal for age. Uh, and just you're all going to remember this now that the most common cause, uh, genetic cause of neonatal onset epilepsy is KCNQ2, and you'll never remember or never forget that EEG of that baby seizure that I showed you, and that sodium channel blockers uh, are at the moment, uh, the best treatment, and there's other treatments being studied. So moving on to the guidelines for children in the second half here. Uh, so there's two parts, uh, part one, indications, and part two, uh, technical specifications. And then we'll talk a little bit about the critical care terminology as well. Again, this is a huge topic, and I've tried to pick out the most salient points uh, for this overview. So uh, Again, the, the indications and some of the, the preamble and introduction is very similar to neonatal about when to consider CCEG. Uh, but basically, uh, abnormal mental status following uh, a generalized convulsive status epilepticus. Um, uh, prior to children who have these convulsive seizures or status epilepticus, prior to the CCEG are at higher risk of non-convulsive seizures. Uh, a third of, of children on CCEG after DCSSC uh, uh, had finished had ongoing electrographic seizures. So uh, if the patient stops jerking, it's still, you still should con finish connecting the CCEG and, and monitoring that patient. Uh, if the patient has an acute brain injury with altered mental status, fluctuating mental status with unknown cause, has uh, uh, periodic discharges or abnormalities on the routine EEG uh, or is in a pharmacologic para paralysis uh, or is having spells that you want to uh, rule out seizures. These are the typical indications and uh, like for neonates, uh, fairly straightforward. And so you also want to uh, assess the efficacy of therapy. So uh, as we just said, non-convulsive seizures and non-convulsive status epilepticus is common after you have treated a, a clinical seizure. Uh, you want to do this uh, also to monitor the efficacy of your uh, drips of anti-seizure medications. So if they're on uh, it's super refractory status and they're being treated with um, uh, midazolam, you want to have them on CCG as well. And uh, also, a patient who had non-convulsive seizures, you know, two days ago or two weeks ago, and now has altered mental status. That's again uh, a uh, common reason to uh, to treat the, or to put the patient on CCEG. Uh, here's a uh, another common use of CCEG, which is not necessarily seizure related, though patients with strokes 
Uh, if you're not used to looking at CTs, the uh, left side there uh, is a little bit darker. So that's what it looks like when you have uh, a stroke uh, on your EG. And that corresponds to the uh, left hemispheric uh, delta activity. And although it's quite uh, easily seen visually there, uh, a lot of times we'll use uh, the quantitative EEG uh, to uh, monitor this and uh, anybody can really just glance at it and see that there's a change in power. So <clears throat> how how do you do this sort of monitoring? Uh, if you have a, a, something called a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, you might start uh, several days after the hemorrhage or until the risk of vasospasm has passed. It can be up to a couple of weeks, I understand. I'm not a stroke uh, specialist, but I think so. Uh, and uh, with this, well, this is the indication for the EG, you might want to look a little bit more often because uh, even for older kids, you might want to uh, intervene and give, uh, you know, a, some something to uh, treat the clot or to uh, treat the bleeding. Uh, so you might need to look uh, even more often. As I just mentioned, quantitative EEG analysis displays the, the power ratio uh, in relation to time. And you might want to assess the severity of the encephalopathy and have a better idea of prognosis. So uh, again, even if you're not recording seizures or non-convulsive seizures necessarily, uh, the EG still has a lot of use. Um, remember um, years ago before the, the dawn of CT and MRI, EG was used uh, for many different things uh, besides just seizures uh, to see if you had a tumor, to uh, uh, evaluate headaches. Um, there was a, a lot of different, a lot of different um, uses that uh, have been sort of superseded uh, by uh, imaging primarily, but it still can be very useful and it's not invasive. But uh, favorable um, uh, background continuity, variability, reactivity, and uh, if you see sleep structures. Unfavorable, if it's isoelectric or, or flat and invariant, uh, if it's burst suppression, um, if there's periodic patterns, which we'll talk a little bit uh, about later, and of course, non-convulsive seizures. So I promised we were gonna talk a little bit about the uh, terminology, the 2021 version. Uh, so this is uh, most recently updated uh, from a, a year before, or 10 years before. Um, it's um, honestly very confusing and very detailed. Um, I have, you know, taken some bits and pieces to sort of summarize it. But I, again, from this recent uh, pediatric atlas, I like their their summary of of the um, uh, terminology and how to apply it. So there's something called main term one and main term two, which uh, main term one basically talks about the uh, localization of the spikes. Uh, and then the uh, main term two uh, talks about the um, uh, sort of speed or, or the, the type of, of discharge. It is a periodic discharge, rhythmic delta or a spike wave. Um, and then the third step uh, is uh, the anatomic location, localization, uh, symmetry, uh, frequency, uh, sharpness, uh, so really getting into the minutia about um, uh, the patterns that we're seeing in order to differentiate them and try to see if there is something that uh, might be uh, pathognomonic or predictive of prognosis. So, um, you know, trying to use this in your EEG reports is um, uh, very important, uh, but also want to, um, you know, have, have an idea of the uh, forest um, and not the trees uh, uh, from a practical sense. So here are the uh, multiple things we have to think of with the EEG background. I think we talked about most of these uh, with the neonatal uh, background as well. The posterior dominant rhythm obviously is not seen in, in newborns uh, and uh, the, the state change is not in all, um, not in all of the babies and the anterior posterior gradient is something that uh, develops in uh, older children uh, and adults as well. So just a few examples, uh, again, from this uh, recent atlas. 
uh, some asymmetric sleep spindles, so indicating some dysfunction over the left hemisphere. Uh, and then an example of discontinuity. So if you're uh, you know, flying through the EEG and you see this pattern, uh, that would uh, you know, chalk up as an unfavorable uh, uh, as aspect of the EEG. Uh, this can also be caused not only by brain dysfunction, but also by uh, medications. As you uh, give more and more sedating medications, you can uh, uh, induce discontinuity. Uh, a few other uh, criteria that are listed, rhythmic and periodic patterns, um, of course, electrographic and electroclinical seizures, and brief potentially ictal rhythmic discharges, and the ictal interictal continuum that we talked about. Uh, the uh, lateralized periodic discharges, or LPDs, used to be called PLEDs. You might hear people talk about that. Uh, so here's an example of these periodic lateralized discharges, meaning they're on one side. That shows you a picture where they're uh, more diffuse than we would call them uh, generalized uh, periodic discharges. So you get the picture. And then uh, something called, or what's called serpids, uh, now called stimulus-induced ictal discharges. I believe this case uh, was a teenager who had had a carbamazepine overdose and uh, had some stimulus, which, uh, which caused this um, discharge. Uh, it does evolve, um, but each of those bars is a second, so uh, it's not uh, terribly long. So uh, from this section of uh, pediatric uh, ICU guidelines, I want you to remember that uh, about 95% of uh, non-convulsive seizures are detected in, the, in within 24 hours of CCG. That's why we it usually continue it for that long. Uh, and uh, about a quarter of uh, CCEG uh, will capture some sort of a non-epileptic event. So the nurse or the parent uh, or the doctors will, will press the button for some jerking movement, um, heart rate change, something that uh, ends up not being a seizure. Uh, so it can be useful for ruling that out and not over-treating the patients. And finally, that uh, NCS can only be diagnosed with CCEG. So um, if the patient's having non-convulsive seizures, you're not really going to know uh, unless you uh, put them on CCEG. One caveat there, if, if you can't get the EEG that quickly and you think the patient might be a non-convulsive, uh, having a non-convulsive seizure or non-convulsive status, uh, you can probably uh, not not be uh, doing doing any harm if you give a test dose of medication like lorazepam to see if they get better while you're waiting for the EEG. And then just a few slides talking about outcomes. As I mentioned earlier, there's not a lot of evidence and I think all of the, the literature, they start off by saying that uh, we need more studies, we need more uh, prospective studies looking at um, outcomes. Uh, we don't really know what um, uh, treating uh, or not treating uh, neonatal seizures means, um, and we're, we're trying to find more information and, and do the best things for our patients. So one, one recent study from 2013 um, looked at uh, neonates with clinical seizures and, and noted that they have a higher association with morbidity and mortality, which might make sense, but the outcome depends on etiology. So the reason for their, that they're having seizures uh, is probably more uh, more important than the fact that they have seizures. And uh, another uh, recent paper from uh, 2014 uh, looked at the seizure burden in the PICU uh, and showed that it was uh, independently associated with short-term outcomes. So uh, they determined that um, a seizure burden of more than 12 minutes in an hour was uh, strongly associated with neurological decline. Uh, and this, uh, they hypothesized that meant that um, electrographic seizures independently contribute to brain injury and worsen outcome and uh, is at least some uh, partial evidence that early anti-seizure medication is warranted in this population so that we should treat and not just watch. 
So I think that'll be the, um, you know, continued debate. Uh, and um, as we gather more and more data, as we monitor more and more patients, we'll uh, hopefully answer these important questions and make sure we're doing the right things and the best things for our patients. So with that, I'll, I'll end and uh, try to answer any questions that have come up. Uh, I can't see the chat at the moment, so I don't know if, if Jeff will moderate for me. I certainly will. So uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Millichap related to these topics, please enter them into the chat area now, and I'll uh, read them off, and we'll take care of that. Uh, I also wanted to make sure that uh, you could check the file section. Uh, and uh, a number of the reference articles that Dr. Millichap has referred to are available there uh, for download. So if you hover on the uh, file listing itself, uh, a download button will appear and you can download that article. So um, I wanna thank you again, Dr. Uh, Millichap. Um, I think uh, a lot of people have limited experience with uh, you know pediatric and neonatal patients and uh, the evolving science in looking at uh, EEG for some of these particular uh, uh, genetic cases. And um, even when we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, hypoxic ischemic uh, encephalopathy, it's one of those things where, um, uh, again, uh, if they're not involved with it all the time, they may not be aware of all of the requirements. So, uh, what we have uh, are several questions here. And I'll, oh, great. Yeah, and I'll start off with the first one. Um, at what age do you consider asynchronous sleep spindles abnormal? Uh, so that's a, that's a uh, fairly easy one. Thank you. Um, so uh, we generally say that uh, the sleep spindles will become synchronous uh, sort of when uh, at the same time as the corpus callosum, which is the sort of highway that uh, connects the two hemispheres and the middle of our, our brains uh, becomes myelinated or gets its insulation incomplete. And that's somewhere around the end of the second year um, or into the third year of life. So um, this, the sleep spindles will start up um, you know, at a couple of months in some kids and will uh, continue to be symmetric but could be asynchronous uh, up until that that old. Okay. Another question is, um, in your opinion, um, is there uh, an advantage or a difference between using a full 1020 uh, electrode set versus the 8 to 12 um, uh, location EEG in neonates? Uh, yes. So, uh, in my opinion, um, I agree with the, the guidelines of, of using the modified 1020 uh, system. Uh, I think if if you've you know looked at a, a neonate's uh, skull um, and uh, imagine trying to put um, all of those electrodes on there, they'd be right on top of each other. <laughs> and I think in a lot of places they don't necessarily use collodion; um, they might use uh, paste. Uh, and you'll certainly get a lot of um, assault bridging and, and other uh, artifact if you use that, um, you know, full uh, montage. So um, I think even if I wanted to, I, I don't know that it's um, technically advisable. Um, and uh, I would um, uh, be more comfortable interpreting uh, with a, a fewer number of electrodes. Related to that, there was also the question about the difference between uh, your modified 1020 and the reduced channel amplitude integrated EEG and whether or not, again, you feel there's a, a difference there. Right. I knew somebody was going to ask about that. <laughs> you know, to be to be perfectly honest, the play, uh, I've you know, only worked at, at one place uh, for 14 years and we don't really use amplitude integrated EEG. And uh, I think if it is used, it's interpreted by the neonatologist and not by neurologists, funnily enough. Um, so uh, I don't have a great deal of uh, experience with uh, the comparison. 
suffice it to say that um, uh, my, my understanding of amplitude integrated AEG is that it, it has, you know, a limited um, number of uh, electrodes and therefore is covering a limited um, uh, amount of, of the brain. Uh, so there could be, you know, say, um, uh, if the if the electrodes are placed in the front and the uh, seizures are only in the back, uh, then that patient will be seizing and nobody would be aware uh, unless uh, the seizure became uh, uh, large enough or uh, used and um, or involved enough of the brain so so whereby the the electrode would pick it up. So uh, I I don't I think it's probably. Uh, better than nothing, but uh, not um, a replacement in my mind. But okay. uh, it, that's my opinion, and I, I read EEGs and not AEG, so I might be skewed. Somebody. Okay. okay. Uh, is there any concern, or or have you had uh, issues with skin breakdown in uh, neonatal uh, EEG in particular? And how has that been addressed? That's a very good question. Uh, the, um, you know, we, we have excellent technicians. And so honestly, they are, are the ones who are, are doing this every day and, and uh, are uh, taking care of the, the baby's skin. Uh, but there is some, um, you know, cleaning that needs to be done, especially with um, using the paste. Um, and so that abrasion can uh, lead to some uh, irritation sometimes, so it has to be done very carefully. But as long as you're not taking the electrodes on and off, I think that the uh, the skin stays uh, fairly well intact, especially if the patient's not um, uh, not it doesn't have malnutrition or some other issue which would uh, contribute to skin breakdown. Okay, all right, very good. That's all the questions. Uh, I did want to let everybody know that this webinar has been recorded. The recording will be available uh, for review uh, within uh, 24 to 48 hours. And uh, you have a chance then to go back and uh, look at some of the key points that you may have missed or that were gone over quickly and uh, see it again. Thank you again, Dr. Millichap. It was a pleasure. And we uh, look forward to seeing the rest of you on our next webinar in August. Take care.